open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 63. I have been um, thinking and trying to be prayerful about what a theme for this year would be and how this would inform the life of our church. And, and the Lord dropped this, this, this uh, word in my spirit a few weeks ago. Um, just the word witness. And, and I was very much just wrestling with witness, witness, witness. What does it mean for us to witness? Not in the sense uh, solely of us just walking around like you see some folks, and I'm not hating, right, uh, who stand on the corner with a megaphone and they're preaching and witnessing in the public space about, uh, you know, how the world is coming to an end and, you know, folks better get ready because Armageddon and Jesus and hell and, you know, all those. But, but, but I was also thinking about um, the book of Acts, verse number one, where it says that, and you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you to be my witnesses. And I want to submit to us today that this year is uh, an important time for us as followers of Jesus and the church at large to bear witness in a season and time where Jesus is often being hijacked, misinterpreted, misappropriated uh, to all kinds of causes and things that I want to submit are actually hurting the cause of Christ in the world. That there is an opportunity for you and I as followers of Jesus, we as the Way Christian Center, to bear witness in 2017 of the love, the power, the salvation, the justice, the healing, the hope that we all have found in Jesus. And so for the next month or so, uh, we're going to be opening up what does it mean to bear witness? What does it mean for us to be positioned uh, more powerfully to bear witness of this great gospel that has been handed to us uh, from the ancestors, those saints, those mothers, those fathers, those followers who came before us? What does it mean for us to bear witness in this age so those who are looking for God can easily find God? through the lives that we live. And uh, I hope and pray that this will be an uh, invitation for all of us to think more deeply about how we can bear witness in this season. In the book of Isaiah, verse chapter number 63 and verse number 7, uh, it is a the lectionary passage that is uh, set aside for the church <clears throat> across the world, and I thought that it would certainly be a very powerful, uh, quick kind of uh, encouragement for us to think about how we are not only able to bear witness, but how can we imagine God becoming that source and power for us to be able to do so. Uh, I'm entitling uh, this message, The Art of Becoming. The Art of Becoming. Verse Number seven, uh, it may be on the screen, hopefully. Uh, verse number seven, I'm reading from the, the message translation. And uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, to you about uh, these verses that declare, I'll make a list of God's gracious dealings. All the things God has done that need praising. All the generous bounties of God, his great goodness to the family of Israel compassion lavished, love extravagant. For God said, without question, these are my people, children who would never betray me. Wow, I pray God can say that about us. Amen. <clears throat> verse, uh, number seven, uh, verse number eight continues to read, so he became their savior. In all their troubles, he was troubled too. God didn't send someone else to help them. God did it himself in person 
Out of his own love and pity, God redeemed them. God rescued them and carried them along for a long, long time. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Uh, Bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. The art of becoming. The art of becoming. Now, the book of Isaiah was written to the children of Israel who were alive during the post-exilic period of Babylonian captivity. And it's so important to contextualize this in this manner because the prophets were always called to the children of Israel to remind the children of Israel of the promises and covenant they willingly made with God when they were in bondage in Egypt. They were the ones who made a commitment to say that, God, we will worship you and no other. They were the ones who said, God, we will not murder our brother or sister. We will not commit adultery. We will not lie and cheat. We will not build idols and images uh, to compete with uh, your uh, priority in our lives. They made these commitments. We will take care of the widows and the orphans. We will observe Sabbath, meaning we will rest on some days. We will do all these things uh, as our commitment to you, acknowledging that if we hold up our end of the bargain, we expect that you're going to do the same for us. You will protect us. You will save us out of our troubles. You will defeat our enemies. You will give us life and prosperity and favor in the earth. And, and often, as many of us do, uh, life goes on and we forget that we made these commitments to God. So God was in the prophet. And the prophet would show up and be like, hey, remember when you made that promise? Right? The prophet was intended to remind the children of Israel of their covenant responsibility. But because the children of Israel walked away from God, they ended up in Babylon, in captivity, and their children and their city and their kingdom was left in tatters. But because God is more faithful to us than we are to him and his word, God brought the children of Israel out of bondage and God gave them a second chance. This is the passages of scripture that were prophesied and written to the children of Israel as they came out of bondage. God was saying, listen, I will remind you of your responsibility, but I will also recommit to you my responsibility. And isn't it a blessing to know that God will not forget God's promise to us, even in the middle of some of our own amnesia? Hello, somebody. I know 2016 is, you know, in our rearview mirror, but how many of you can be honest that there were some seasons and times in 2016 where God kind of got put, maybe not on the back burner, but certainly on the side? Hello, somebody. Amen. And, and isn't it interesting that the faithfulness of God, in spite of our inability to always follow through with what we said we were going to do, God still remained faithful. God brought you through the year. Hello, somebody. I mean, some of us came through the year with a lot of tears. Some of us are still in the struggle of 2016. And we're trying our hardest to leave some of that behind. Amen. It's so fascinating. You know, you can look on Facebook and everybody's talking about how hard the year was. Few folks said this was the best year of their life. Few folks said this was the worst year of their life. Some folks said, I'm so glad 2016 is over. Amen. There was all kinds of, of particularly the last month or so, folks uh, were being uh, lost to death this last month month and and you know people who uh, are are celebrities you know folks uh, unfortunately die every day and how many of you know when you lose somebody your world stops amen uh, but when a celebrity or something dies it usually sends a shock wave 
across all kinds of different communities because they had a certain platform or influence or impact on many different people from many different sectors. And as we experienced the winding down of 2016 for many of us, it has left us a little bit of, of anxiety and worry about what will this new year bring. I want to submit to you, my brothers and sisters, that there is an opportunity for God to become whatever you need God to be in your lives in this year to come. Now, this does not mean that your year will be trouble free. Because for some of us, uh, we've gotten over that lie and that myth, right? I mean, they used to tell us in the church that if you, amen, Lord have mercy. They used to tell us in the church that if you came to Jesus, he would make everything all right. And uh, the reality of it is that uh, things didn't work out that quickly. Some of us came to Jesus weary, worn, and sad, and the song says, I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. And some of us are waiting for the rest and the gladness. I wish I had a real church up in here today. I know all of us who've been in the faith long enough, we realize that the longer we wait for God, God will show up. But there's a few of us that are still on the waiting list. Hello, somebody. And I want you to appreciate that part of what I believe the prophet is lifting up for us today is that there is an art of God becoming everything that we need. And the first thing that I'll lift up is as I uh, try to move uh, with some deliberateness through this message is that the first thing you and I may have to do is keep a list of what God has done. Somebody holler, don't forget what God has done. Now, it's so important for you and I to not be folks who are overly uh, 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 um, fixated on all the things that are not happening, that we forget all the things that God is doing. 2016, even with all of his trials and challenges, how many of you know if you look back, God did some things for you that you asked God to do and God showed up? Hello, somebody. I think that there are at least, I call it a top 10 list of things that you ought to write down to remind you of God's faithfulness in this past year. We didn't have a New Year's Eve service, so we didn't get a chance to, to invite you to do this kind of an exercise. But I want to submit that if you're going to go into 2017 uh, with this idea that God will become whatever you need God to be, some of us need to refresh our memory about who God has been in our lives. Because often we can get overwhelmed, so overwhelmed, even when we don't want to forget, we'll forget. I remember my wife used to send me to go get some uh, items for my daughters when they were born, you know, and you got to make the daddy runs to the, to the store. And, you know, she, you know I used to have a, a memory that I thought was photographic. Amen. Where I didn't have to write anything down. So I get to the store. She said, I need you to get some milk. I need you to get, you know, some formula, some pampers, some wipes. And then that's the only three things I remember. There's at least five other things that I'd be standing there in the middle of the aisle, just stuck. Like, man, what did she ask me to get? What did she ask me to get? And I usually would get maybe two of the remaining four or five things, thinking I got everything, and then I'd get home, and she'd be like, you forgot the bottles. I'd be like, oh, Jesus. So I have to go all the way back to the store, get all the way back in my car, drive all the way down the street, repark, pay at the meter, Stand back in line because I thought I remembered that which I had forgot. So now that I'm older and more experienced in this life, I write everything down. Because when I write it down, it actually serves as a constant reminder to me. Because I don't know what I had to endure to get to the story that made me forget what I was supposed to remember. Could it be that 2017 is going to be a year for God to become who you need God to be in your life 
if you're able to remember who God was for you, even in your low moments and high moments of 2016. What does it mean for you and I to be able to make a list, as the scripture says, a list of the things that God has done? So I don't have amnesia. I don't forget. I will recount all the deeds that God did for me, the bountiful blessings that God has wrought in our lives. And I know that the year was filled with a whole lot of challenges for many of us. But I want to submit that in the middle of some challenges, God did bring you out. God did answer some prayers. God did do some things that are worthy of your memory and his continued worship and glory. What does it mean for you and I then to take and make every effort, even in a difficult season, to remember what God has done? One question then that I will invite you to think about, what are your top 10 things? What is the list of blessings from 2016? And how has the highs and the lows, the good and the bad, the challenges and the triumphs of this past year, how have they prepared you for the journey ahead? How can you and I make a list of what God has done and not allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by what we think won't or will happen? Somebody pat yourself on the chest and say, I need to make a list. I need to make a list. I can't forget those things you sing a song. said, Jesus, I'll never forget <clears throat> what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget it. No, not ever. Somebody holler, I won't forget. I won't forget. The second thing that I think the scripture lifts up, if God will become what you need him to be, listen, you have to be honest about all of your troubles. Somebody say, be honest about your troubles. Verse 9, it says very plainly that in my distress, God showed up and he became familiar with my distress. God became my savior in all of my troubles, in all of my distress. Could it be that part of what you and I need to do is invite God into all of our distress? Some of us discriminate where we want God to be. Some of us pre uh, kind of, you know, we, we pre-plan. Well, God, I'll let you uh, have this part of my troubled life, but this part I'm going to kind of deal with on my own. But wouldn't it be interesting for you to allow God to become your Savior in all, everybody say all, all of your distress. What are the parts of our lives that we need God to become our Savior in? What are the parts of our lives that we need God to show up and carry our troubles? If you're like me, I feel sometimes like I'm supposed to carry my burdens, my struggles, my problems. And I'll give God only the things when I can't handle them. But what would it look like for you starting on the first day of the year to say, God, in all my trouble and in all my distress, I'm going to invite you to become my savior. Become my savior in my family struggles. Become my savior in my health struggles. Become my savior in my work of justice and my service to the community and, and my struggle against the systems and the powers. Become my savior. Fight my fights 
for me so I don't have to fight them myself. Help me to be, God, that which you need me to be in this season so you can show yourself strong. 2017, some of us are going to have some struggles and some trials and some distresses. But I hear God saying, how can I become your savior? In the middle of your distress. Not at the end of your distress. Not after you figure it all out. But while you're doubting, can God become your savior? While you're struggling, can God become your savior? While your faith is dying on the vine, while you're in the hospital room, while you're in the counselor office, while you're in the unemployment line, while you're on the front lines of struggle against racism and, and some oppression, can God be your savior even in those places? I want to submit that the art of God becoming your savior requires you to invite God even into those places that you are prone to disinvite God from participating in. So could it be that often we can be guarded in inviting Jesus into our distress? Are there lingering and emerging problems you need the presence of Jesus to show up in? And how are you in this season inviting Jesus into your troubles? Last thing that I'll say this scripture, very powerfully in verse number nine, it says that God redeemed them. God rescued them. God carried them all the days of their life. Could it be that the art of God becoming who you need God to be in this season is you have to let go and let God redeem you? Rescue you and carry you. My loved ones, I think if there is anything that our culture makes us feel uh, um, required to do is to make our own way. To, to, to pull up ourselves by our own bootstraps, if you will, to solve our own problems. But as followers of Jesus, as people of God, don't you know that we have a privilege where we can actually say to God, I need you to hook me up today. I need you to rescue me because I'm in a mess. I need you to redeem this situation because this situation is threatening to destroy my confidence, my faith, my hope. I need you to carry me, God, through this season because my legs are weak. My heart is broke. My mind is troubled. But in order for God to do that, we got to let go of the need to try to fix it all ourselves. It's hard for God to rescue you when you are fighting off God's rescue. Pastor Nisha used that, that great analogy when she preached a few weeks ago, right? God sent all those, those, those rescuers to the person that was drowning and because the person wouldn't accept the rescue, the person ended up drowning getting to heaven, talking about, God, why you didn't rescue me? And God said, man, I sent the lifeguard. I sent the helicopter. I sent the tugboat. And you refused all of it because you were holding on to only one way your rescue was going to happen. Some of us, God can't carry us because we steadily trying to walk through our own power while God is saying, you need to surrender to me. That's why this consecration is so important for some of us, because we got to break some of our own needs and desires that will make us continue to go our own way rather than submit our will to the will of God. I do believe that this is an opportunity for you and I 
to make a public expression and declaration of what 2017 will and must and can be. And that's why on this day, we are going to experience as a community the public declaration of our intention to follow Jesus and not turn back. Follow Jesus and not turn back. There will be many, 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 many people, ideas, circumstances that will try to convince you and I to turn around. But I want to submit to you, my brothers and sisters and loved ones, you can't turn around. You can't go back. You must continue to follow Jesus even through the storm even through the hardship and the difficulty. And on today, we have some candidates for baptism who have said, I want my, one of my first acts of 2017 to be the public declaration of me following Jesus with no turning back. You know, baptism is one of the ordinances, the sacraments that we are taught to fulfill. Jesus was baptized. So I tell folk often, if Jesus was baptized, why you can't get baptized? Praise the Lord. Unless you're better than Jesus. And if you are, we'll talk about that a little later. Praise God. Jesus was baptized with water by his cousin John. And after his baptism, the sky opened and the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The, the practice of baptism has been a ritual in many religious traditions, a ritual of cleansing, a ritual of commitment. But I shared with our baptism candidates that Christian baptism has carried with it even a more sacred significance in our tradition where we call it a sacrament. And a sacrament is the collapsing and the intersecting of the divine and the secular. It is the supernatural interfacing with the natural. It is the human and the sacred sharing a kiss, if you will, an intersection that reminds us that God's presence is not limited to a single exercise, but it is ongoing and it is consistent. We used to say that God's going to trouble the waters, that the Holy Spirit troubles the waters and it enacts a spiritual regeneration. It cleanses, it, 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 it identifies and it incorporates us into the body of Christ, not just the church, the way church, but the body of Christ that knows no time or place or title. The body of Christ that people from every time period in every city and country, every background have made this decision to follow Jesus and not turn back. And what I love the most about baptism, it says that you that are buried with Christ through the waters of baptism, the waters of baptism representing a grave, the, the, the burial place where Jesus was buried. You that are buried with Christ through baptism will be raised to new life through the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. I don't know about you, but that got to be some powerful, powerful spirit. If it can raise the dead body of Jesus from the dead. Think of how the waters of baptism are working to raise us up from our dead places and spaces as we daily decide to follow 
Jesus. I don't know about you, but this is a wonderful time for us to join in the act of baptism through our celebration, our witness, and our recommitment. This month, we're launching our consecration. Today, we've already made and recommitted ourselves through the body and the blood of Jesus and the sharing of the Eucharist. And now we will share this great day of celebration and public commitment to follow Jesus with the candidates for baptism. I've got my mind made up and I won't turn back. Cause I want to see my Jesus. I've got my mind made up. I've got my mind made up. And I won't. Cause I want to see my Jesus someday. I've got my mind made up. candidates for baptism stand everybody let's celebrate and thank God for them everybody ready everybody ready all right come on brother Mario you're gonna be our first I got my mind made up I've got my mind made up and I Brother Marie. Jesus said to his disciples, Go to all the world and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all these things. The disciples responded to this message and preached on the day of Pentecost to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, Brother Marie, upon the confession of your sins, the death and the burial and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I've got my mind made up, and I won't turn back because I. Tanisha baptize her, some of her young people. So go ahead, sit down, put your hands over your chest. So Melena, on a confession of your faith, we are coming together and standing as believers in one accord. And we acknowledge that you are acknowledging today that you are professing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
and that you are going to be raised to new life just as he is raising us into new life. And today you are deciding, I have made up my choice and I've made my mind up. So today we baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I won't turn back because I want to see my Jesus someday. I've got my mind made up and I won't turn back because I want to see my Jesus someday. Goodbye, world. I stay no longer with you. Goodbye, pleasure. I stay no longer with you. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. Brother Sean, upon the confession of your faith, the death, the burial, resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we baptize you for the remission of your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Goodbye, world. I stay no longer with you. Goodbye, pleasures of sin. I stay no longer with you. I made up my mind to go that way. my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. Come on, sisters. Let's get some sisters to come stand around and, and let's celebrate and stand with our dear sister Suzanne. Come on. Come on, sisters of the church. Y'all come around. Y'all come around. Y'all come around. Sister Suzanne, upon your confession, the death and the burial and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Goodbye, world. I made up my mind to go that way the rest of my life. I made up my mind to go that way the rest of my life. Got my mind made up and I won't turn back. Cause I want to see my Jesus someday. I got my mind made up. And I won't turn back Cause I want to see my Jesus someday Come on, sisters, gather around Sister Whitney is assuming some leadership, advanced leadership in our children's ministry. And she said, Pastor Mike, I want to be baptized again. That God will just fill me up as she leads this part of our ministry. So Sister Whitney, upon the confession of your faith, the death, the burial, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Goodbye, world. I stay, no I stay no longer with you. Goodbye, pleasures of sin. I stay no longer with I you. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life.